In this VMK, I'm going to be showing you how to take the existing framework that we've been working with and modify it slightly so that we can dynamically change the controls that are used within the game. Let me show you what I mean. Once you start your application, you'll have your Start New Game Options and Quit buttons. Under the options, we've added this Change Keyboard Button Controls, and in here, we're going to populate all the different controls that are going to be available inside of the game. You can see here we have Move Forward, Move Back, Move Left, Move Right, as well as Turning, and then we have Jumping, Crouching, we can turn the flashlight on and off, and we also have the Console. If you have different kinds of controls for your specific game, maybe like an Attack or a Defend or something like that, you can just add them into here as well. For each action listed here in gray, we have a specific key that's mapped to it. You can see here, to move forward right now, you have to press the W key on the keyboard. To move back, you press S and so on. So if we go into our game and we press those keys, we notice that we move around in the world. But now we can go in, hit the Escape key, go into the Options. You'll notice that this Change Keyboard button controls is also here. So we can go in here and change the way that the mapping works. If we want to change the forward keys to be using the arrow keys instead, we can do that as well. You notice I just hit the control I want to change, hit the Change button, and then it asks which key would you like to map to this specific controller action. Since I selected the down key, I'm going to press the down arrow button on the keyboard, and you notice it automatically fills in the keyword here, down. I'll do the same thing with left and right as well. And we'll now go back into the game. And now notice that when I press the W, S, A, or D, nothing happens, because the controls are now using the arrow keys. So when I use the arrow keys, we can now move throughout the game. So all this mapping is getting handled for us dynamically behind the scenes using this new mechanism for controlling our player. The other thing that I incorporated into this uh, list box is, for instance, let's say someone wanted to go in here and, uh, I don't know, let's pick on the jump. Let's say we wanted to map the letter C to represent jumping. Well, notice that we already have the letter C mapped to crouching. If we go in here and click change and then press letter C, C gets mapped to jump, but notice that crouch now gets mapped to none, which means there is no way that the player can now crouch inside of the game. So let's give this a try. If we go back into the game, if I press the C key, you notice now I'm jumping. But there's no way for me to crouch now because it's been disabled. I go back inside of here, I can go back and select Crouch and maybe change this to a different mapping, maybe I'll make it the letter G, and then if I go back in here, press Continue, C is jumping, G is now crouching. And the last thing I wanted to mention here is that the mapping here for the controls gets saved to a configuration file on our hard drive. So when we quit our application and restart, all these commands here will get saved uh, and get reloaded every time our game starts up. So the user won't be responsible for having to change these every time the user starts up the game. Once they get changed once, then they get saved on the hard drive and they can be used as many times as the player wishes. So that's how this is all going to work once we implement the mechanism. We're going to create this list box. We're going to create a mechanism to map controls with keys, and then any time inside of the game engine when we want a specific action to happen, we'll use this mapping to figure out whether we're supposed to move the player, make him turn, make him jump, make him crouch, whatever we're trying to do. So let's go into our code and get started. The current method that we use for handling the keyboard is done inside of the GameOpenGL handle keyboard function. We open this up, you'll notice that we have a bunch of checks here to see whether uh, certain keys are being pressed. And then if they are being pressed, we call functions that are inside of the scene class to perform whatever action we need. So here we can see that we've allocated the W key to represent moving forward for the player. Well, now we need to generalize this so that we can associate keys with actions and then these, this association is what we're going to be using to determine what functions we need to call to perform that action. So the methodology that we're using here is going to change uh, quite a bit 
to make sure that we can dynamically change the keys that are mapped to the different actions. We do need to know ahead of time what actions the player is able to perform so that we can create this kind of lookup table that defines here are all the different actions, here are all the different keys that are associated with those actions. So that's what we're going to be starting off with. This mapping or this table lookup that we're going to be creating is going to be stored inside of the user settings. So let's open up usersettings.h and scroll down to the very bottom inside of the member variables. At the bottom here, we're going to create a structure called control info and it's going to contain two items. It's going to contain an integer, which I call here I key index, and an std string. Uh, and here I called it str action. The key index is going to tell me which key on the keyboard is associated with the specific action, and str action is going to be a human readable string of text that's going to tell me what the specific action is supposed to do. You'll remember back inside of uh, core.h, let me open that guy up. Uh, in here, we've defined a bunch of virtual keys for the letters of the alphabet, um, as well as some numbers at the top here. Uh, but if we scroll down to the action section, we've this defined this enumeration, which has all the different actions that we can control within the game. I'm going to be changing the names of these in this VMK, so we're, come, we're going to come back to this uh, file, but we need to associate these actions with this specific key as well as this string. So to do that, we use this guy down here. It's an std map, which is going to associate a specific action with a specific control info. So one of these is going to be mapped to one of these structures. And one of these structures has a key ID as well as a string. So there's three things inside of this table. You can imagine this table as having three columns. The first column is going to be action. The second column is going to be key index. And the third column is going to be str action. This is just a string. For every single row inside of this map, we're going to have a different control that we're going to be um, controlling. So this std map is going to be saved inside m underscore m actions. If you're not too familiar with std maps, I would recommend you go into the C++ VMKs where I did a specific tutorial on the standard template library. In there, I talk more about uh, how an std map works. But if you're familiar with std maps, let's just continue on. The mapping between these actions and the specific keys are going to be stored inside of a file. So we're going to use the same sort of structure that we used up here for a file name. Uh, remember, this file name here indicates the file name that has all the configurations for the screen resolution, as well as for whether you want the mouse inverted, the mouse speed, things like that. Well, we're going to use a different file name to store the action table, um, which contains the mapping between the actions and the keys that the user specified. So this member variable here, mpsz control file, is going to be the file name of that control mapping table. The other thing we need to change inside of uh, user settings is in here in the public section, we're going to be adding a Boolean array of 256 keys. This uh, Boolean array of keys is going to act in this very same way that our um, game open GLs array was working up till now. If you scroll down here, you'll notice we had the same sort of array right here. Anytime a key is pressed, we're going to flag uh, that specific key inside of this array using the virtual key codes that we've defined um, inside of here, as well as the ones that are defined inside of the Windows uh, core library. So we'll come back to that. Uh, so make sure you add this uh, array up here. And we're adding this structure, this std map, and a pointer down here. OK, now let's start making some modifications to our functions within the user settings. Uh, upon initializing our user settings class, we need to make one change to the constructor. So let's go inside of our constructor code. And uh, you'll notice that what we're currently doing is just initializing all of our variables. And then at the very bottom, we're allocating memory to hold the name of the file that we want to save inside of our own member variable. 
this name of the file is the file that we're going to be using to store all these parameters here. Now, we have some member variables that we need to initialize. So we're going to do that right here. Our file name for the control map is going to be null initially. Um, we're going to default all of the key presses to be false, meaning nothing is being pressed on the keyboard. And we're going to clear our action table. This is the, that uh, std map, which is going to map all the actions to all the keys that we're going to be wanting to use with those actions. The constructor for our user settings gets called inside of our main. You'll notice if we go inside of the global functions, win main, and uh, if we scroll through here, we'll see that we create a user settings right here. And we're passing in the name of the file that we want to initialize some parameters. Well, right under here, we're now going to create a new function call. We're going to take user settings and call a function called load action table. And here we're going to pass in a, the file name of the action table. This file here, if it doesn't exist on the hard drive, that's OK. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to load in some default values that we want to use in this action table. And if this file doesn't exist, then the defaults are the ones we're going to use. However, if this file does exist, then we're going to overwrite the defaults with whatever values are saved inside of this file. If something else goes wrong in, inside of this function call, we're just going to just display an error message to the screen um, and continue on normally using the defaults, again, that are set inside of this load action table. So let's go in to uh, user settings and define this load action table function now. Just going to scroll down to the very bottom. And I might as well put a bookmark here because I'll be coming back to this quite a bit in this BMK. Uh, so I've defined load action table. It's going to get a pointer to a character string and it's going to return a Boolean. Going into our C++ implementation, right at the very bottom here, let's implement that function. So this function is going to load the user control settings from a file. We're going to first assign the default controls to these actions. So in here, we're defining that we want to insert into our std map. And what we want to insert is a pair between this action and this control info item. So this action called moving forward is going to be mapped to this control info item that's the W key on the keyboard. And that is going to have a human readable string that says move forward. So you can sort of see the structure that I've laid out here. This is the first column, this is the second column, and then this is the third column inside of that lookup table. Moving back, we have the S key. Moving left, we have A. Moving right, we have D. Moving left, we have Q. Or sorry, looking left and looking right are Q and E. Jumping is space. Crouching is C. Flashlight is F. And then the console, to get it to activate, we're going to be using the tab key. The text that you see here, this is the text that's going to show up inside of our GUI list uh, that we just finished creating in the previous VMK. Now, because I've renamed our action uh, keywords here, none of these are going to be recognized by the compiler. What we need to do is go inside of core.h and redefine our actions right over here. Now, the reason why I renamed the actions, you don't really have to rename them, but any time that I'm making changes to my code that I know are going to be influenced um, quite heavily based on changes that I've done previously, I like to rename things so that uh, none of these values here are going to be left behind from old code. So even though I need to still have something called move forward, I've renamed it to be moving forward so that if I do forget to change something that's called move forward, the compiler doesn't compile and say there's no errors. Instead, I want the compiler to complain so that I know I have to go and take a look at that specific chunk of code and change it because I know I shouldn't be using something called move forward anymore. I want to be called moving forward. So that's the way, that's the reason why I've renamed things inside of the action enumeration. Okay, so here's the redefinition of all the actions. You notice now that I've tried to um, define each of these as verbs so that uh, it's a little bit easier to understand the code once we uh, start looking into the way that these are going to be implemented. doesn't really matter too much 
how you name these, so long as they're descriptive of the action that you want to be performing inside of the game. All right, let's go back inside of, uh, where were we? User settings.cpp. So now all of these here will be defined. You'll notice if you highlight over top of them, a little tooltip will pop up telling me what is the ID number for each specific action. All right, so these are the defaults that I'm defining. And then the next thing I do is I check this file name. If it's null, there's nothing else I can do because uh, an improper file name was specified, so I'm just going to return false. And once I do that, back inside of the main CPP, we're going to display this uh, error message to the screen saying cannot load the control action table. All right, if a file name was specified, then we're going to allocate some memory and save it inside of our member variable. We're going to then copy over the file name that was passed into this function into our member variable, and then we're going to try to open that file based on the file name that was specified. Notice that the file name is going to be a binary file, not a text file. So it's not going to be human readable if you open it up in a text editor. You'll only be able to see the values inside of this file if you open up inside of a hex editor. If we are able to open the file, then we're going to continue on down here. However, if we can't open the file, then the file pointer value, fp, is going to be null. So we're going to go inside of this if statement, and I'm just going to return true, saying the file cannot be opened because it doesn't exist. You could change this to be false so that an error message pops up, but I just left it out so that it doesn't pop up that message. And again, we're still going to be using these default values inside of the game. If the file does exist, what we're going to do is go inside of this while loop and extract all the values that are saved inside it and overwrite any action values that we've uh, defined up above. So here we can see we create two integers, uh, i action and i key, and we read in the first value, which is going to be i action, then we read in the second value, which is going to be i key. If either of these fail, we're going to exit out of this while loop. However, if both of them succeed, then we're going to take those two values we're going to take i action, map it to be an enumeration, and then pass it into this function call here called change control key. And what this is doing is it's going to go through all of these uh, actions inside my table, find the appropriate one that is specific to this action, and remap it to be whatever this key value is specified. And we're just going to continue doing this for everything that's inside of this file. Once we get to the very end of the file, one of these will break out, so we'll exit out of the while loop, we're going to close our file, and then we're going to return true. So that's all that this function is doing once we call load action table. We need to implement this change control key uh, function call because we haven't defined it just yet. So let's go inside a user settings and uh, define it up here. Right in here, we're going to add this change control key function call. And uh, it's going to take an action and then it's going to take an integer. And then we'll go back inside user settings.cpp and right underneath load action table we're going to implement that function. So this function is going to take the selected action which is passed in here and it's going to associate this specific key with this action. If this key is already used by some other action inside of our list table, then we're going to replace all other actions that use this key with uh, no key or in other words, nothing's going to be mapped to those other actions. So let's take a look at how this works. We're creating an STD map iterator, call it IT, and we're going to go looking for this specific action that we want to be replacing. If we find it, then the iterator value passed in here is not going to be equal to the end of our action table. If it is equal to the end, then that means this action doesn't exist inside of our table, so there really isn't anything we can do. We just return. If we did find the specific action inside of our table, then we want to replace the current key that's associated with this action with this key that gets passed in here. So to do that, we can take the iterator's second value, which is going to be pointing to, let me see if I can find it, it's going to be pointing to this structure, and inside of that structure, we want to be replacing I key index. So you can see here, we're taking the second guy, I key index, and make it equal to whatever value is passed in here. Now we're going to look for duplicates. We're going to start at the very beginning of our action table, and we're going to go all the way to the very end. 
and we're looking for the matching I key index value for the second parameter inside of the iterator. However, we don't want the one that is associated with the action that we've overwritten. So if it's not equal to this action that we're passing in here, and we do find a match, then we're going to overwrite it with the value 0. And 0 is going to represent that there is no key associated with this specific action. So this is going to uh, replace all of our duplicates with none. Uh, and then after we're doing all of that, we're done. So that's the way we're going to change a specific control uh, any time that we need to. So what we've written so far is the ability to load in our uh, file from this control.config uh, and fill in the action table. We also need to write in the code that will allow us to save this action table to this control.config file once the program is done. Because anytime that the user make is, makes any changes to this action table, we want to make sure that we update this control.config so that the next time the program is run, this control.config file will be up to date. So to do that, we're going to need to create another function. And this time it's going to be a private function because the user will not need to specify the save action table function call. Internally, we're going to be calling the save action table from within um, one of our other functions. And that other function is called uh, save file. We've already written the code inside of our game engine to call save file. Um, and here we're going to be saving um, the one file which is associated with all the values that have to do with the screen resolution, the viewing depth, filter, invert mouse, mouse speed. So at the very bottom here, let's add the following. We're going to call the save action table function and uh, we're going to implement this function right underneath save file. You could write uh, this code uh, for the save action table directly inside a save file, but I just decided to write my own function to do that action. So here's the implementation. We're going to check to make sure that we have a file name uh, associated with this action table. If we don't, then we don't know where to save it, so there really isn't anything we can do. We're just going to return. Next thing we're going to do if we do have a file name is we're going to try to open the file for that file name. And this time we're specifying we want to write a binary file. If we can't open the file, we're going to return because there isn't anything we can do. However, if we can open this, then we're going to go down here and we're going to have to go through a for loop creating this action and key pair that we're going to be saving to the file. We we'll need an iterator that will iterate through our STD map. And we start the iterator at the beginning and we go all the way to the end one at a time. And each time through, we're going to be extracting the first value from this iterator, which is going to be uh, back in here. We're going to be taking this value here. This is the first one. This is the second one. So the first guy is our action. And we can see that we're saving that first value as I action here. The second value that we want to be saving is the key value. And that we pull from our structure, which is this control info. And remember, control info has two values. It has I key index and the string value. But we're only interested in the I key index. So here we're taking the second guy's I key index and saving it inside I key. Once we have these two values, we can write both of these to our file by calling fwrite, and here we're passing in the address of I action. We're saying it's an integer. We want to be saving one of them to our file pointer, and then we do the same thing for I key. So this is going to go through our entire action map and save both the action value as well as the key associated with that action to the file. Once we're done, we're just going to close the file pointer, and uh, that's the end of the function. So now we've implemented a method to load any values that we may have inside of a file to overwrite the defaults. And then once we're done, we also write uh, our entire action table to a file so that next time that we load our program up, the appropriate actions get remapped to our uh, key map table. Now, by now, you're probably interested to actually see these uh, action and key mappings inside of our GUI list that we created in the previous VMK. So let's implement the code to display this action key mapping pair. Uh, you'll remember back inside of our scene, uh, let's pull this up, scene initialize. At the very bottom here, where we defined all of our controls, 
uh, where are we here? Right here, we've populated our list box with just a bunch of numbers uh, for every single row. Well, instead of doing this, we want to display our action map table. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use pUser settings, and we're going to get the number of controls that we have. So this is a function we're going to need to write. This is going to return to us a number, and we're going to use that number to iterate through this for loop. Every time through this for loop, we're going to clear out our vList. And remember, vList was the value that we used whenever we want to populate things inside of our uh, GUI list control. So we're going to clear it initially, then we're going to push back onto it the control action text. So this is the first column of data. And we're going to push onto it into the second column of data the key that's associated with each of these actions. So these are two other functions that we're going to need to implement inside of pUser settings. Once we've done that, we're going to call add item for the p list, and p list was our control that uh, we're using for our displaying everything to the screen. That's our GUI list. So. We need to implement get number of controls, get control action text, and get control key text. So let's go back inside pUser settings now. Here's the definition of those three functions. Get number of controls, which is going to return an integer. Get control action text, which is going to return an std string. And get control key text, which is going to return an std string as well. Both of these are going to accept an integer value, and this integer value is going to be used to look inside of our std map to find out uh, which specific uh, action and control key we're talking about. So let's go and implement those three new functions. The first one is pretty simple, get number of controls, because all we need to do here is return the number of controls saved inside of our std map. And to do that, we can just take uh, m underscore m actions, get the size of it, cast it as an integer, and return that out of our function. The next function, get control action text, is also not too difficult, because you'll remember that inside of our constructor, we already created the string variable here that contains the string value for the specific action that is associated with this action key. So in here, what we're going to do is we're going to take this i value and make sure that it's valid. So it can't be less than 0, and it can't be greater than or equal to the size of this container. If it is, then we're just going to return a null string out of this function. If the i value is valid, then what we're going to do is create an iterator, which is going to iterate through our std map. Uh, for the exact number of uh, iterations that i here represents. So if we have five passed in here, we're going to iterate through this for loop five times, going to the fifth value inside of this std map. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get the uh, string value that's stored at the current iterator location. And we're using the second value here because uh, back here, you remember, this is the first. This is the second, and the second is a control info, which contains that string. So that's why we're using second here and string action. So that's pretty straightforward. It just returns the name of the control action that is associated with this currently selected um, action inside of the action table. The last function is a little bit more tricky. It's going to behave the same way that the previous one did. However, we actually don't have any text that represents the key mapping and uh, the string of text associated with that key mapping. So let's take a look at the code. Again, where you check to make sure that the i value here is valid. It can't be less than 0, or it can't be greater than or equal to our container size. If it is, we're just going to return a null string. We're going to create another iterator for the std map. We're going to iterate through to the correct value inside of this uh, std map. And then what we do is we call this function called get key text. We need to write this function, but we're going to pass into it the value of i key index. An i key index is really just a number that represents the specific key that's mapped to the action inside of this table. So we need to write a function here called get key text that's going to return a human readable string 
for every single key that the user can press on the keyboard. Now this is going to depend really on what kind of keyboard you're using. I'm using a US based keyboard so I'm using the US keys that are associated with it. If you're using a different kind of keyboard you may have different keys associated with different ASCII codes. Because of that this next function which I'm about to show you you'll have to tweak a little bit so that it displays the correct text on the screen when you press specific keys on the keyboard. All right, let's go take a look at this uh, get key text. Uh, first thing we need to do though is go inside user settings here and create a prototype for that function. So that's what we see here. It's going to return an std string and I called get key text and I'm passing in a integer value for the key index. Let's go into our user settings.cpp and right at the very bottom, let's define the following. This is a very long function because there's a number of things in here that uh, we can output to the screen. So by default, we're going to uh, save this std string called str and we're going to define it as being none with uh, little square brackets around it. So this is the text that will be returned out of this function if I can't find a correct mapping for this key that gets passed into here. This key that is getting passed into here is a virtual key code that uh, is associated with a key on the keyboard. The virtual key code is defined inside of a Windows file. So if we go in here and go take a look at the declaration, if you look inside of winuser.h, this is where all the virtual keys are defined. Now you'll remember that some of them were also defined inside core.h uh, right here at the very top. We define these keys for the numbers above uh, the letters on the keyboard and then for all the letters on the keyboard as well. So for everything else, it's going to be defined inside of this winuser.h file, which is part of the uh, platform SDK that gets installed on your computer. Now, if you just scroll through here, you'll see that there's a lot of keys. Uh, we have left mouse button, right mouse button, cancel button, middle mouse button. You have the back button, the tab key, clear, shift, control, pause. You have a bunch of Asian characters over here. We have space, next, home. These are keys associated with the keys located above the arrow keys on the keyboard. Then we have the arrow keys themselves right here, left, up, right, down. We have uh, some other keys over here which are associated with the print screen, the pause button. Here are the ASCII keys. These guys are actually the ones that are defined inside core.h. So we can skip over those. Uh, here we have the left, right, uh, Windows keys, and then we have some more down here. We have the number pads, we have uh, the minus, the plus, the divide on the number pad, we have the F keys, uh, and so on. So we have a lot of keys in here. And then there's also specific keys to regions as well. Uh, if you have a Windows keyboard, you may have these uh, browser buttons, media buttons on your keyboard. Um, and then if you have a US keyboard, which is the one that I'm using, then specific keys like the OEM underscore one is going to represent the colon and semicolon key. For other countries, this key code would be something else. Uh, so to have a look through here uh, to figure out exactly which key code is associated with key buttons on your keyboard. Knowing all of this, we can now go inside of the user settings.cpp and take a look at what I've written here. I'm taking a look at the key code and trying to figure out what text is associated with each of these keys. So if we have the virtual key code for the left mouse button, I'm going to display to the screen L mouse. Right mouse button, I'm going to have R mouse. Middle mouse button, we have M mouse. Backspace is going to be displayed as this. Tab key. We have the enter key. The pause key. Caps lock is virtual key code capital. Space bar. Prior is actually page up. Next is page down on the keyboard. End and home are obvious. Then we have the arrow keys, left, up, right, and down. Snapshot is the print screen. However, this is a special character which uh, I'm going to talk about in the next VMK. So if you try using this, you'll notice it doesn't work. Uh, insert and delete. We have uh, the number keys. Now the number keys 
as well as the letter characters, they're all ASCII characters, so we can treat them as if they're just an ASCII code. Because of that, we can use the format function call, which we created in, the, I think it was the previous VMK, and we can use that to format the string that gets displayed to the screen. So we're going to pass in percent %c here, and then the ASCII code uh, is the parameter that gets passed in. This is going to take that ASCII code, convert it to a string of text, which we can then output as an std string, and save it in here as, it, as our uh, str variable. So in the number pad, we do something similar, but uh, a little bit different. We want to display a bracket num and then some sort of number in here. And the number that we want to display is going to be the key code minus hex 30. If you take a look at the hex codes for all the number pad keys, uh, they're located in here. You'll notice all of them are starting at hex 60. Well, hex 60 is very close to the ASCII code for uh, 0. And 0 is actually lined up nicely here with number pad 0. So if I just take the hex value 60 and subtract hex value 30 from it, I'm going to get hex value 30, which is the ASCII key code for 0. So you see, what I've done here is I've just mapped these codes to be an ASCII code, which I can use to display to the screen. So that's all I'm doing here is I'm taking the uh, key code minus hex 30 to give uh, an ASCII code, which I can then pass into here, format it using the format function, and then save the std string out to my member variable. For multiply, we have number pad uh, star, add is number pad add, separator is the enter key on the number pad, and this is also a special key, which I'll show you how to handle in the next VMK. Subtract, decimal, divide, uh, the function keys, F, uh, F1 all the way to F12, that's what I have on my keyboard. If you have more function keys, you can add them all in. They're all uh, handled inside here all the way up to 24. Um, you'll notice that uh, F10 is a special key as well as F12 is a special key. I'll show you how to handle those in the next VMK. We have the number lock, scroll lock, shift key. Shift key is a special character. Um, which I'll show you how to handle, but um, the actual implementation is not very stable, so I wouldn't recommend trying to use the right shift key. Uh, that's why I've commented it. And again, I'll talk about this more in the next VMK. Control key is shown here, uh, left control, right control, as well as alt key, left alt key, right alt key. Uh, differentiating between left and right is a special kind of function, which I'm going to introduce in the next VMK. So for in this VMK, uh, don't worry about the controls or alts. And then we have our OEM keys. We have the colon, the equal sign, the comma, the minus, the period, slash, uh, tilde, and then some brackets. The slash is a special ASCII code inside of our Windows compiler. So we can't just write slash like this. This doesn't uh, get handled properly by the compiler. If you want to display a single slash on the screen as a string text, you should write two slashes inside of the double quotes like so. This will now display only one slash inside of our uh, GUI window. Uh, and finally, we have the closing bracket and the apostrophe down here. So those are all the keys that uh, we are able to press on the keyboard, and we've now defined how they should be displayed on the screen if they are being pressed uh, or if they're being mapped to specific keys. All right, let's save all of that. And uh, where were we? Back inside of scene, uh, we've just gone through and implemented this guy here, get control action text and get control key text. So now we have a way to populate our uh, GUI list with all the actions that are going to be mapped to specific keys. Let's see if we can uh, build our project and get it to run to see our uh, results. We're going to have to wait a little bit because uh, we've changed user settings, and user settings is used quite heavily within uh, all of the other projects. Okay, we've made a few bugs, so let's go in here and clean them up. Okay, because we've renamed all of our actions, we're going to have to go in here and anytime we're using the old actions, we need to now use the new action keywords. 
Now we're going to be changing the functionality of how uh, all this works. So for now, let's just uh, comment all of this stuff out just to get our code to compile. Let's just take this guy up here and try to recompile him. Got some more instances down here inside player action. So let's just comment both of these lines out as well. And what else do we have? Inside camera move, we're going to comment all of this code out. And let's try recompiling. A little bit better. And finally, inside of, where are we? Handle keyboard inside a game OpenGL. Let's just go ahead and comment all of this code out as well. Still something else. Uh, what do we got here? Oh, uh, these errors are because of capitalization. Try recompiling, and now we're good to go. So let's give this a run and see what happens. Inside of options, inside of here, you notice now we have a listing of all of our actions, as well as the default uh, codes that are associated with each of these actions. So forward is up, we have back, left, right, turning, jumping, crouching, flashlight, and console. And if we go into here, uh, we can't change any of these. If we click on change, it doesn't do anything because we haven't written the code to change these. So uh, let's go and implement that next. Just quit out of this. Anytime we press the change button on that uh, screen there, what we want to do is we want to go to a new game state. Uh, and inside of this new game state, we're going to display a message to the screen that says press any key to map to specific controller or whatever. Uh, in that screen, we're going to be waiting for a key press on the keyboard or a mouse button press on the mouse. As soon as something is pressed, we're then going to uh, interpret what which key was pressed and then associate that key with whichever um, control is currently selected inside of our GUI. So all that mapping is going to get handled automatically for us, and we're going to use that existing function that we already wrote inside of uh, user settings. Uh, it was um, this guy right here, change control key. So we're going to know which action we want to change, and we're going to know which key to change it to. But we need to write in the mechanism to be able to go into this new game state anytime that the change button is pressed. To do that, let's go inside core.h. We have to define a new game state. We're going to go into here and define game state key press. And we're going to treat him in the same way that we treat all of our other GUI items. So going inside of game OpenGL, inside of frame, if our game state is called uh, key press, we're just going to call our show menu function call. And this guy is responsible for rendering all the GUI controls to the screen. Now we need to go define some specific controls for that uh, state. So inside of initialize, uh, right at the very bottom, oh, uh, wrong initialize, we want to be inside of scenes initialize. Right at the very bottom of this guy, we need to define what is going to be shown on the screen. Be down at the very bottom. A lot of controls in here. Okay, here we go. So we're going to create a GUI text control. Uh, we're going to give it the ID key press message, and we're going to need to define him inside of core.h. Uh, let's just add him here at the very bottom. So he is going to use the UI fancy ID number, and we're going to position him sort of uh, in the middle of the screen near the top. The text that we want to show on the screen is going to be press a key to map to this control slash action. And uh, we are going to take this control, ptext, 
and is associated with the game state key press um, state. So now when any time we're inside of the game state key press state, this is what we're going to see on the screen. But we still need to implement the functionality to go inside of this key state anytime we press the uh, button change button, uh, which is located on the key map uh, game state. And that functionality is done inside of scenes, um, GUI check hotspots. In here, you'll remember that anytime we press a key, uh, and we are not movable, then we're going to go inside of this switch statement. And let's just add it to the very bottom. So if we are pressing the key map button change, uh, we're going to change our current state to be game state key press. We're going to change the button's press state to be false and over it to be false as well, and then we're going to break out. Now if we go and run our program, let's uh, compile it and uh, give it a run. You'll notice you'll be able to go into here and select an item, click change, and we get this message here. Press a key to map to this control slash action. But if we press any key on the keyboard, nothing happens. We haven't integrated the methodology to go from this game state back to the previous one where we could select the items inside of the GUI list. So we now have to go and implement that. To do that, we want to monitor when we're inside of this game state, and we want to perform a specific action when a key is pressed. And any key that gets pressed will get handled inside of uh, game OpenGL um, inside of our message handler. You'll remember any time a key is being pressed, we go inside of here because we get the Windows message key down. So currently, if we press the tab key, we're going to toggle the console. If we press the escape key and we're in the play state, we're going to go to pause. And otherwise, we're going to go into here. Well, we're going to add in an extra statement in here that is going to handle the case of if we are inside of the key state where we're waiting for a key press. So here we're going to add the following code. We're going to get the current game state. And if it's equal to game state key press, that means we're waiting for a key to be pressed, and a key was pressed because we got this message here. So we're going to take the parameter that this message has, uh, and this parameter is the current um, virtual key code that is representative of the key that is pressed. So we're going to pass that into this function here called change control. And we're going to write this in a second. It's going to be part of our scene. Uh, but after we do that, then we want to return back to our previous game state. So we're going to call change state with no parameters. And you remember, when we pass in here change state with no parameters, we automatically go back to whatever state we're coming from. So that will handle our automatic uh, change back to the current state which we want to be at that has that uh, list box with all those options. So let's go in now and create this function change control. We're going to open up uh, scene.h. And let's add it into here. Uh, it's sort of related to the GUI, so I want to kind of group this function call with all the other GUI stuff. Um, let's put it right here. Change control. We're going to pass in a key code, so I key index. And let's go into our scene class, and we'll put it right above render intro. This function is going to change the key that is associated with the currently selected control in our list box. So the first thing we need to do is get a pointer to our GUI list box. We know it's going to be saved inside a game state key map. So we're going to go through our list of GUI controls that we're containing inside of the game state key map. And we're going to be looking for the one that's called GUI underscore key map underscore list. This is our list box that we've defined inside of the initialization function. Once we find it, we're going to save our pointer to plist right here. Then we're going to break out of our for loop. If we don't find that plist, then we know that there's something wrong, and we can't go any further inside of this function, so we're just going to return. Otherwise, we're going to go down here, and we're going to get the string text that represents which button was pressed on the keyboard. We're passing in the virtual key code that got passed into here, and we're passing it into this function, which we just finished writing earlier, that returns the std string for that specific key that's pressed. 
If the return value is none, then that means either an invalid key was pressed or a key that um, doesn't have a mapping to it was pressed. In which case, what we're going to do is rewrite the I key index value to be zero, because we know that zero represents none. Then what we need to do is call PUser settings change control key. This is the function that lets us change the specific key that's associated with a specific action. So the first thing we need to do is get which control action is associated with the currently selected list inside of our GUI list. Uh, we have to write this function. But once we know this action, we can then say, here's the key that we want associated with this action. That's going to make the change for us. And then what we need to do is re-render all of the items inside of our GUI list. Because more than one item may be changing, if there's duplicates and things like that, it's best to just clear out all everything inside of our list box and then re-render all of the text row by row. So we do that exactly uh, in the following section of code here. We create another std vector of std strings. Um, we check to see how many rows we're going to have inside of our control. And then for every single row, we clear this list get the action, get the text for the key that's associated with that action, and then add it to our P list. So this repopulates our GUI list with all the appropriate keys now associated with all the actions. If we knew that we wouldn't have duplicate keys, we wouldn't have to do this. We would only have to change this one control and then update just that one guy. But because more than one may change, if there are duplicates, we have to go through this process. All right, so to make this work, we need to create this one function here called getControlAction. So we're going to go back inside of user settings and implement that one function. Uh, where were we putting them? They were down at the very bottom here, right here. We're going to be returning an action, and we're going to be passing in an integer, which tells us which row we're interested in getting the action for. Save this, and we'll add this to the CPP right at the very bottom. So here we go. We check to make sure that this I value is valid. It cannot be less than 0 or greater than the container size. If that's the case, we're going to return no action. Otherwise, what we're going to do is we're going to create an iterator that's going to iterate through our STD map. We're going to start it at the very beginning of our STD map, and we're going to iterate through this many times. Then we're going to have the uh, iterator pointing to the correct action inside of our table. So all we need to do is return the first uh, item inside of that container. And remember, this is the first item. This is the second item. So we return him, and he is going to be our action that we're interested in. So that should do it. Um, let's build our code and uh, see if it works. Looks like we missed something here. Hmm, this is a strange error. Um, not quite sure why we're getting this. Let's just do a clean solution and try rebuilding. That didn't look like it fixed it. You should be able to do a string comparison between an std string and a string literal like this. Um, and in the code that I'm pulling this from, this is exactly what I've done. So I'm not quite sure why this is not compiling. I must have a typo somewhere nearby that's causing this guy to fail. Let's see what happens if we just comment this chunk of code out. Well, he succeeds. Okay, well, we can go to the help files to take a look at error C2678, see what that brings up. Hmm, same uh, description that we got down here. The only other thing that I can think of is maybe in our pre-compiled headers, we didn't define um, the appropriate string header. 
Uh, there we go. Uh, over here, we should have a include for our string, um, but we're, we forgot to include that, so we shouldn't really be using strings at all. Um, we just include string over here. I think that should fix our std std string. Okay, let's give this a uh, compile and see if this fixes our problem. Because we've changed the std afx.h file, everything's going to have to recompile because this is our core that we're uh, using for all of our other code. There we go. Um, what we were getting there earlier was std string is a type definition coming straight out of our standard template library. And the equal operator for the std string is defined inside of uh, this include file here. But because we were failing to include it, uh, the compiler didn't know how to handle the equal operation. I was surprised that it was actually able to compile any of the code that was using std string. But, um, well, we fixed that, so we can now continue on. So we got our code um, to run and write. Okay, so if we run our code now, under options, under here, we can select an item, let's say strafe right. I hit change, and then I hit the right arrow key on the keyboard. Notice now that uh, the strafe right has been remapped to have the right command. If I can go in here and choose left, and backwards would be down arrow, and forwards I can make this the up arrow. And I can also check for duplications here. Let's say I'm going to change crouch to be the space bar. Notice that jump, which used to be space, is now converted to none, and crouch is changed to space. So all of our mapping seems to be working correctly with our uh, list box here. However, if we go back um, and into our game, you'll notice that I can't physically move around in the game. As a matter of fact, no matter what I press, nothing is happening. I seem to have broken the code to allow us to move around in the world. Well, let's go and correct this. The reason why everything is broken was because earlier we went inside of our scene um, player action functions and we've commented out all of this stuff here which is supposed to handle our uh, cases when we're moving our players around. We've commented everything out so right now there is no way to control the players. And we needed to do this because otherwise we wouldn't be able to compile because we've changed all of these um, action keywords. Well, we've got our code to compile and we can see that our action map is getting associated correctly. We need to now create a mechanism that lets us generically figure out whether a specific command is being pressed on the keyboard or not. And we can start this off by going into our game OpenGL, um, where was it, handle keyboard. Inside of here, we've had originally all of these different statements that check to see if specific keys are being pressed. Well, all of our key presses are now going to be checked through our user settings. You'll remember in here we defined a, um, a member variable, this guy here, that is supposed to keep track of which keys are pressed uh, on the keyboard. So this means that we should go inside of our GameOpenGL header file and remove this guy because we don't want him here. When we remove him, uh, he's actually going to break a lot of our code, but we're going to go in and correct it so that it works with the new mechanism. Now the new mechanism, um, let me show you how it's going to work first, and then we're going to go in and clean up all of the code. Instead of doing it this way, the way that we were uh, doing it before, we're going to replace all of this code with the following. We're going to check to make sure that the console is not open because if it is open, we don't want to handle the player actions. This is only a special case for the player actions. Um, so here we have console is not open. We're going to move the player by calling player action with no parameters. Uh, inside of player action, we're going to distinguish between which action is being performed. Over here, we're going to handle the headlight separately. Um, 
And the way we do that is we're going to create another function inside of PUser settings that is called isAction. And here, this guy is going to be a Boolean return value that's going to tell us true or false whether our specific action is being triggered. Um, the first parameter is the action that we're looking for. And the second parameter tells me whether I should reset the key that's associated with this action or not. You remember that uh, before, any time a key was pressed, we handled it, and then shortly after, we always set it to false like this. But now, we won't have to do this extra setting on the back because we'll have a parameter, the second parameter, that will reset it internally inside of this is, fun is action function call. So I can delete this. We don't need that there. So if this is action uh, function call returns true, that means flashlight is pressed, so we're going to do whatever needs to get done which for us would be the toggle of the headlight. For the player action, you'll notice we're going to have very similar code to this, where we're going to be checking is action for moving forward, moving backward, and so on and so forth. Let's go into our scene header file. I seem to have lost it again. Uh, here it is. And we had a player action function call earlier but we are passing in the action that we wanted to uh, check. This time we're going to remove that and replace it with an inline function that is going to be called player action. We're going to keep this guy here because he's still going to be responsible for taking care of the player action whenever we're moving the mouse. The other function which we now need to add is uh, this guy here, is action, and he's going to go inside of our user settings class. So let's go inside of there and add him as well. He's also going to be an inline function because we're going to be calling him quite a bit. So I wanted to run as quickly as possible. That's why I'm making him inline. He's going to return a boolean, and with the first parameter is going to be the action we're looking for, and the second parameter is going to be optional. Uh, by default, it's going to be false, meaning we're not going to reset the current key that's associated with this action, but if you do make it true, then we will reset it for you. Now that we've defined those two new functions, we should be able to go inside a game open GL and try to compile this class. This will give us all the errors that are present inside of this class that we need to clean up, so we can just go ahead and do that. Uh, inside of the constructor for game OpenGL, we can remove this since we no longer have M underscore B keys as a member of uh, game OpenGL. Um, what else do we have in here? Uh, inside of the message handler, any time that a key is pressed, we were setting that specific key's value to be true. Well, we're not going to be doing that uh, this way anymore. Instead, we need to be doing it through our user settings class. So we're going to be replacing this code here with the following. P user settings, M underscore B keys, and we're still using that same parameter. We're now changing this guy to be true. Uh, down here, we're checking to see if the console is open. Um, and if it is, we're going to do some work. So in here, we're going to have to replace this using the new is action keyword, is action function call. And well, as a matter of fact, what we can do is uh, clean some of this code up because you'll notice that we toggle the console based on whether the tab is pressed. And then down here, if the console is open, then we're going to do this. Well, what I'm going to do instead is remove this guy from up above, change this to the if statement rather than an else if, and then replace this code with the following. If the action is console and it's if the action for the console is currently set then we're going to change this guy to be we're going to check to see if the action for the console is triggered and if it is we're going to reset the value and toggle the console then down here we're going to check to see if the console is open if it is we're going to take the console input value based on the W parameter value, and also based on the shift key, 
we're going to be checking both of these and passing them into the console input. After all of that, that should be a capital C here. Um, after handling the input for the console, we're then going to reset the key uh, inside of P user settings to false, and then we're uh, ready to go. So that's going to handle all the cases whenever we press down on the key. Uh, pressing up, we're going to have to correct this as well, or I guess I should say releasing the key. Uh, instead of using M underscore B keys, we're going to be using the P user settings M underscore B keys. Uh, what else do we have here? So we've handled this guy, we've handled him. Uh, down here, we're checking to see if um, the spacebar, the escape key, or the return key is pressed. And then if they are, we're going to reset them and then change the state. We just need to go ahead and add in our uh, M underscore P user settings in front of all of these, and in front of all of these as well. That should clean up this, 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 and this guy here. And finally, we have uh, some more checks over here. Uh, this is probably due to capitalizations. Let's just check to see if that fixes it. Yep. And uh, one other one here, toggle, should be probably a capital. Yep. And let's try and recompile our code. Some more capitalizations, probably. And there we go. Okay, so that should clean up everything inside of Game OpenGL. Now that we've got that in place, we need to go in and implement these new functions that we're creating and using within our Game OpenGL. So let's start off with uh, this is action function call within user settings. Because it's in line, we need to define it inside of our header file. So I'm going to do it right here underneath our class. We're passing in an action and a reset, which is optional. We're going to get an iterator. We're going to look for the specific action. If we can't find the action, we're just going to return false, saying that there's something wrong. Otherwise, we're going to get the button that is associated with the current action. That guy is going to be saved inside of MB keys. This guy is a Boolean that tells us whether that specific key is pressed or not. So its return value, so its value is going to be uh, saved inside of this B pressed. If we have that the reset and B pressed are both true, we're going to want to reset the value. So we're going to be changing the this value here and making it equal to false. So by default, this guy is uh, false, which means we're not going to be resetting it. But if you do specify true here for the second parameter, then we will reset uh, this specific key to be false only if it's currently true. Then the return value is whatever the value is currently stored at uh, inside of here. Remember, we should save B pressed before we reset it here, otherwise, um, if you just go and return this guy here, you may be returning the wrong value because you're resetting it right here. That's why I created this temporary variable called vpress to save the value that was uh, stored here before we reset it. So that's what is action is going to do. The other guy, which we just added in, was inside of scene, was it? Yeah, player action. Uh, and again, he's an inline. Uh, function call, so we're going to be adding it inside of the header right here at the very bottom. So what we do is we go through every single different uh, action that you can perform and check to see if it's true. Is action moving forward? If this is true, then we want to take the player and move him forward. If we want to move backwards, we're going to take the player and move them backwards, and so on. So we do this for left, 
right. We do the same thing for looking left, right, up and down. Uh, jumping, we handle this way. Uh, crouching, we handle him here. And then uh, when we're not crouching, we're going to be standing up. So we handle him uh, this way here. So this simplifies our player action commands quite a bit. Let's save this and try recompiling now. We seem to have introduced a few bugs, so let's just go in here and clean them up. Uh, right, we commented out this uh, old way of handling the player action, so we can uh, just comment him out because we're no longer going to need him. As a matter of fact, we can just delete them all together. We don't need them at all. And uh, we, we still need to leave this guy here because we are going to be using him in a second. Uh, but let's just compile our code and make sure that everything is fine. Okay, everything does look fine. So let's go and clean up this player action where we have the two parameters passed in from our mouse. All we need to do here is we can comment this out and instead of having look right, we can just rename this to be looking right because that's the new keyword that we're using and we're using looking up. And everything else should follow through correctly, I do believe. Um, let's just double check one other thing here. This move call, if we end up calling him, we're actually calling camera move. Uh, oh. And inside here, we've commented out all of these things here whenever we want to perform a move action. So in here, we need to do a little bit of updating as well. The only thing we really have to change here is our keywords to represent our new actions that we're going to be using. So starting from the top here, we change this to be moving forward. Here we have moving back, moving left. Moving right, looking left, looking right, looking up, looking down. And I think that's it. So let's uh, build this and uh, give it a try now. If I run through, uh, go to the options into the keyboard, you'll notice that we still have our new reset values here, up, down, left, right, none, and space for the jump and crouch. These got loaded in correctly because we automatically saved our configuration to a file, and anytime our program starts up, it reloads our previous values. So let's go into our game here, and we can see I can turn around, and using the W, S, A, or D, it doesn't do anything. However, when I use my arrow keys, I can now move correctly inside of the world, forward, back, left, and right. And if I press the C key, it doesn't do anything. However, if I press the space bar, it's crouching. Is that the action we were expecting? Space bar is crouching. Yeah, uh, it seems to be working fine now. Uh, and one other thing I can just quickly show you is uh, inside of uh, Windows Explorer, here's the code that we're working on. If we go inside of the build, debug, and save folder, you'll notice now we have this control.config file. This is that binary file that we created that has all the associations uh, saved for our table lookup. If I go and delete this file and rerun our program, you'll notice now that all of the controls have been reset to our defaults and our defaults have been hard-coded within our game. So anytime that you want to reset back to uh, the old values, that's all you need to do is just delete that one file. Uh, then you can go back in here and reset them to however you like based on uh, the values that you're pressing on the keyboard. So give that a try. Uh, there's quite a bit of material that I covered inside of this VMK, but hopefully it's um, not too difficult to follow. You may have to watch the video a couple times to get a, a understanding of where to find everything and how everything got changed around. So play around with that, but uh, as you play around, you'll notice that there are specific keys that uh, when you go in here and click change and then press on the keyboard, they don't behave the way you expected them to. Uh, for instance, the control keys. If I press the left control key, it says left control here. However, if I, if I hit change and I hit the right control key, it still says left control. So we're not handling the control keys correctly. Same thing with alt keys, shift keys, F10, F12, 
uh, the print screen key, and uh, I think there's a few others. So in the next VMK, I'm going to show you how to handle those extra uh, special keys.